Ooh, hello! <laughs> Welcome back to Simple Korean! My name is Justin, I'm cold! It's freezing in Vancouver! And by the way, this is a electric blanket that I picked up in Korea. As you can see, it's got Hangul or Korean alphabet letters. And uh, this thing keeps me warm. <laughs> I know it looks, I look like a Tibetan monk right now, but who the hell cares? I'm warm. Okay, so let's start with today's video. Today's video is about how I learned Korean. So if you're probably wondering why you're learning Korean from me, you gotta ask yourself why, because I don't speak fluent Korean. Not at all. Let me tell you my backstory, okay? So my mom is Korean, okay? She was born and raised in Korea and she speaks fluent Korean. But my dad is not Korean and in order for my mom and dad to communicate uh, effectively, they had to both speak English because they both live in Canada here. I grew up my entire life speaking English to my mom and my mom didn't want me to learn Korean actually and she was adamant about this from the get-go. She knew that if I spoke fluent Korean, then I would have Korean influences around me all the time, and she didn't want me to grow up like a typical Korean guy. They drink, they party, they whore, and they go to the army, and they do a lot of nasty shit that she saw when she was growing up. In a way, I agree with her decision not to teach me Korean. However, it did leave me with a disadvantage. I was living in Korea for quite a long time, for many years, and not being able to speak fluent Korean, it, it, I felt inadequate at times, but, you know, starting from zero, from ground zero, not being able to speak like one lick of Korean, like when I arrived there for the first time many years ago, it, it gave me an advantage, it gave me a fresh start, a clean slate, as you can say. That's when my journey to learning Korean started, like when I arrived there many years ago. Basically, my uncle was living there at the time and uh, he lived there for a few years. He was teaching English and he said, Justin, when you graduate from university, come on over and uh, I can get you some work real quick. And I was like, oh, cool. I can live in a foreign country and I can make money. Okay, it'll be interesting. And that's when my journey began many, many years ago. The first word that I learned was 감사합니다 or 고맙습니다. Because you would think that 안녕하세요 is the first word that you would want to learn when you're in Korea, how to say hello. But actually, you know, when you're in Korea, you're going to be buying stuff more often than not. The thing that you have to say is thank you a lot, you know? So like when you buy, when you go to the convenience store and you buy a Coke, what do you say to the lady when she gives you her change, your change? You got to say 감사합니다 or 고맙습니다. The biggest word that I learned or the word that I use most often in Korea is 고맙습니다, which is thank you, 고맙습니다. You got to say like that. You got to say like that tone, 고맙습니다. Okay, so that's the biggest word that I use most frequently in Korea because I buy a lot of shit. Red Bull or candy or those Korean snacks that you see in the convenience store or a blanket like this <laughs> to keep me warm. What do you say when you when you buy something? When you say goodbye, you say 고맙습니다, 고맙습니다. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that that's that's my tip. Most of me that learn that word, okay? That's all the only word you'll need. If you had to learn one Korean word, that would be the word. Kamsamida is too formal, okay? Kamsamida is like, thank you so much, okay? If a girl's giving you a dollar and change, you're not gonna say, thank you so much for this dollar, okay? You're gonna say thanks, right? And the way to say casually thanks is, okay? So remember that. Okay? It's uh, it's not as formal as kam samida, but you know, it it will. It's basically neutral, and it's easier to say actually. You know, when you say it, kumap sumida, right? Kumap sumida, kumap sumida. Instead of kam samida, it's like ham samida. It's just it's a mouthful. Kumap samida, kumap samida, kumap samida, kumap samida. Okay, and you make sure your tone goes up. Kumap samida. Okay, because that makes sense. Don't say kumap samida. Okay. It's not like English where you say thanks, right? Thanks? <laughs> okay. Korea, it's opposite. Konsumida. That that's just friendly tone. Going back to the, the first question, yeah. How did I learn Korean? Okay, so 
this was my original plan, okay? My original plan way back then, okay? Th this, was, this was my original plan. I wanted to attend a Korean university, uh, specifically Sogang University. There are basically two big universities in Seoul, Korea, where you can learn Korean full time. And one of them's Sogang, and the other one's Yonsei. Now, if you ask anybody about these two universities and their Korean program, people will tell you right off the bat that Yonsei focuses more on like writing and Sogang focuses more on speaking. I was more interested in just speaking. Like, I just want to talk to people. I don't care about writing books or essays in Korean. That, that's not me. I mean, if you're a literature background, go for it, my friend. But for me, I wanted to learn how to speak. Talk, talk, yo, what's up? I want to open my mouth and speak Korean and I want people to understand me. That was my goal. However, I had two sitbacks. One was availability and the other was money, okay? so. These are full-time programs at universities. And for a semester, it costs about, I believe, $1,500, $1,000 to $1,500 to attend these programs full-time. And I didn't have the money, okay? I was broke. I was in university. I had a lot of debt that I had to pay, and I just needed to find work and make some money and survive. And uh, yeah, so I couldn't afford these uh, courses in either university. And yeah, so three or four months semester was about thousand to fifteen hundred dollars, and you had to attend full time. So the full time schedule for both of these courses were about from like nine a.m. to one p.m. Monday to Friday, and uh, you're competing with other. Uh, ethnicities or other countries and uh, everyone will tell you the Japanese they have the advantage over you because <laughs> you know the language of Korean and Japanese is very similar they got similar backgrounds and the language structure is kind of similar too so when you have Japanese students in your class you're gonna be competing with like a racehorse when you're riding a turtle okay so it's not gonna be fun for you but uh yeah that that's what the dynamics is like usually i've seen i've noticed that you know there are more countries interested in learning korean so you'll see people from various countries attending your class and that's what i wanted seriously i wanted to like you know be a full-time student in korea in seoul studying and making friends from all these other countries and just having fun drinking and having a blast and just just cracking jokes in korea and all that i wanted that lifestyle so bad but i couldn't afford it and i had to work and if you if you know this about working in korea if you're teaching english you got to work full time sometimes you got to work from 7 a.m to onwards because there's morning classes if you're teaching like business english or if you were working at a school you probably have to start from like 8 a.m or 9 a.m all the way to like 4 p.m or 5 p.m my schedule wouldn't allow it for me to attend these full-time courses learning korean and i didn't have the money and then I just lost the drive because, you know, I just, it just didn't fit logistically. So I felt left out, seriously, uh, to be honest, you know, it's one thing that I regret. And if I did have the opportunity, I would try to take it, you know, you know, if I had the time and if I had the money, I would love to do that because, uh, yeah, my Korean skills have gotten a little bit better over the years. It wasn't in the cards for me back then. If I had to recommend anyone who is serious about learning Korean, I would tell them to take, enroll, I would tell them to enroll in one of these universities, either Sogang or Yonsei, and do the full-time program for at least a year. And then you would have the skills to speak pretty much conversational Korean to anybody on, on the street, pretty much. And I've had friends, I've met people that have you know, enrolled in the courses for about a year and their Korean's pretty good and they're, they can survive and they can get by pretty easily. Pr uh, pretty much better than me, actually. <laughs> yeah, they're, they've improved a lot. So that was what I re recommend. So I didn't learn it through university and my plan B was to enroll in a part-time hagwon. So there are a lot of part-time private schools that teach Korean all around Seoul. And there's one in Gangnam, there's one in Shincheon, there's one in Hongdae. And these schools, you know, they cater to people who are working. So like they, they have like evening classes from like 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays, or they have like a Saturday morning Korean class from like 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. But you notice that most of these classes, you have like, 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 
foreigners who have like zero comprehension or listening ability when it comes to Korean because you'll be stuck in a class most likely with foreigners that are just hashing hacking Korean to bits just saying annyeong ha say yo or kam sa ham ni da they're just just they're just not in that mind frame and I just want to yell and strangle these people you gotta say it like a Korean you gotta be a Korean first in order to speak Korean all right you can't be an American speaking Korean it just doesn't work you can't be oil when you're trying to be water and you can't be water when you're trying to be oil so that that's my analogy when you want to learn Korean first you have to be in the mind of a Korean okay you got to be in it like an actor or an actress right you got to be that role I mean, no one's going to believe you if you're still like, you know, one foot out the door and still being that American or Canadian or whatever country you're from. You got to cross over that, that, that boundary, you know, and you'll notice that these foreigners that do speak really good Korean on TV or like KBS and all that. You, you notice that they did put, you know, both feet in the door, you know, they jumped in the water and they, they have that Korean mindset. It's like if you close your eyes. And you just listen to them speaking Korean, and you'll say, oh, yeah, 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 I guess not, right? You think, like, holy shit, they are Korean. You open your eyes, and they're foreigner. Because <laughs> they adopted that, that role play. And yeah, you know, speaking Korean, you got to be an actor, okay? Whatever language you learn, actually. You know, if you're learning Russian, you need to speak in the low Russian accent voice, right? So be that person, you know, from that country first. That's the first thing you should do. So, these part-time hagwans, I tried a few, and I, uh, they were just boring as hell for me because I just didn't like my classmates, I didn't like my teachers, and I just thought the, le the learning was just like all over the place. It was sporadic. There was no structure in most of these places. And uh, yeah, I just, you know, part-time, is it's like a drop-in. Like when you drop in, there's no beginning, there's no end. There's no, you know, you know structure from, you know, start to finish. And I, I think that if you want to start something, you should start with a, a structure, you know? You can't just drop in every so often and then start and plunge and start Korean because it just feels like uh, you're trying to fix someone else's mess. But me, I don't like that kind of drop-in feel or part-time or students changing every week, you know, like dropping in, dropping out, new students coming in, new students coming out. That's what it's like, you know, attending Korean classes in these, you know, private school so it wasn't for me and it's pretty expensive too and you know the friends that you make in these private hagwans you know these people are working people mostly or just people who just don't have time to make friends or they're not here to make friends you know as sad as it sounds so i really love that networking aspect you know if you want to take a course you you start from zero you go over here and you start that journey with all these other people these classmates of yours i, I really love that camaraderie and you won't find it in these public or private schools in my opinion that wasn't in the cards for me either so how the hell did i learn korean the way i learned korean was through this method that i'm going to tell you right now basically i just drank with korean people <laughs> whoever i hung out with i spoke korean to them and i learned that's how i picked it up i got drunk and i spoke korean <laughs> and drinking is a really big part of korean culture if you can't drink then you shouldn't learn korean because most Korean people, they have a hard time opening up to people. Even if you are Korean, you know, they have a wall. And the only way to break down that wall is through alcohol. If you're trying to make a friend, if you're trying to make a girlfriend, if you're just trying to make a business deal go smooth, you got to include alcohol in the picture. And uh, if, whenever I, I see people not drinking, they're just, you know, they're outcasts, basically. Me, I, I tried to fit in, adapt. So drinking was easy for me. And... You know, if they paid for it, I'll drink it. <laughs> the most important skill I recommend for you, if you really want to learn Korean, if you want to make friends, if you want to network, you got to drink. That's the th that's the key. Piss drunk, like cause drunk, like super drunk. I mean, if you can j handle soju, somek, or... Oh, somek is basically... Oh, soju is you know, the green bottle. Uh, mekchu is beer. If you combine the two, you get somek, and you got soju and beer together. So if you can handle that shit, then you'll really do good in Korea. <laughs> they will love you. I mean, drugs are not allowed in Korea, obviously. It's illegal. So marijuana is not in the cards. And smoking, you don't really have to smoke. I mean, most Korean men smoke. And yeah, most Korean women smoke in secret. But alcohol is number one. I mean, you don't really need to smoke to make friends in Korea. 
but drinking is most important. Just drinking a little bit at least. I mean, you can, you don't have to drink like like a fish, you know, per se. I mean, if you can handle wine or shots of uh, vodka mixed in with some Coke or Sprite or cider or you know whatever. As long as you're participating in the drinking ritual in Korea, then you'll be fine. And that's what I did for many years. I drank, I got to know people, whether it was my coworkers, uh, my students, uh, whether it was uh, business colleagues or just friends or making a new girlfriend. I drank with all of them and I spoke Korean and I did my best. And uh, I mixed that with just learning and picking up words and sounds along the way. I had a textbook uh, with me, but I rarely read it. I mean, it was just really old and outdated. It just You notice that these textbooks, they, they come from like a professor's point of view or some boring person's point of view, like, 안녕하십니까? 안녕하십니까? They're all just like, you know, just two goddamn nerdy people <laughs> conversations. And that's not how people talk. I mean, if you watch like Korean dramas, if you watch Korean talk shows, you'll notice that there's a huge difference like the way they talk in those shows versus what you see in the textbooks. I understand these authors, what, what they're trying to do. They're trying to paint a picture where Koreans will see these foreigners. Oh, they're so respectable. They're so formal. They, they're so polite. You know, that's, that's the image they want to give Korean people. And then the, that's why they print this shit out for you to read and like re rehearse. Nobody says 안녕하십니까 in Korean, okay? Maybe gangsters do in movies, but that's about it. I've never said 안녕하십니까 to anybody in Korea throughout my whole lifetime. No, I would say 안녕 or 안녕하세요. That's it. And uh, these books, these textbooks need to be updated or you need an author like me. Future, I'm thinking of writing a, a, a book in Korean or how to learn Korean in the future. It depends on the person you're learning from. So if you, if you want to learn from a boring person, then go get those books and start learning from them. But if I'm telling you from my experience, from my personality, if you want to speak Korean like me and have fun, make friends and all that jazz, then you gotta have to adapt a different lifestyle or a different way of learning Korean. That's how I learned Korean. I got drunk, drank, uh, I listened to them talk a lot because, you know, when people get drunk, especially Koreans, they have a lot of sad stories to tell you. <laughs> a lot of sad stories. Every Korean has a chip on their shoulder, okay? And they show you that chip once they get super drunk. And uh, yeah, just, Sit there and listen, okay? Be their uh, therapist. And whether they're speaking English, broken English, or Korean to you, you just listen. And you'll pick up words along the way. Seriously, you know, I mean, you know every day, you know, you'll pick up a new word or so. You'll hear a word that's often spoken again and again and again and again and again and again. It's like a fucking loop of Westworld. Loop, loop, loop. I'm living the same life over and over again. And you'll learn it you will get it. And that's how I learned Korean. You know, I I hashed all of these experiences, these life experiences together, and I made my own Korean. <laughs> it's not perfect, but people get me. And I can talk to people easily in Korea. And even though I don't understand 100% what they're saying, I, I get the subcontext. And that's important for you to, to get as well. I mean, people don't really care if you speak perfect Korean or not. I mean, it's just like, ESL students visiting your country and trying to speak broken English to you, you don't really care if it's perfect or not, do you? Hello, uh, do you know where Subway is? You don't really care about if, if it sounds imperfect, do you? No, you understand the subcontext and you gotta go, 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 and they gotta go, 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 and you'd be like, yeah, it's right over there. You know, that's it. As long as people get what you're trying to say, that's all that matters. And Koreans are very forgiving of people who have bad accents or bad Korean, like me. So I wouldn't worry either if I were you. That's my story for today. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below or tell us about how you learn Korean or would like to learn Korean or why you want to learn Korean. And maybe we can talk about it in another video. And this blanket is getting too hot for me now. Subscribe to this channel and oh, yeah, that's a nice swatch, Justin. Thank you. Where did I get it? Oh, let me tell you, my friend. <laughs> I have a new store online where you can buy the exact same watch right here. 
<laughs> on sale for you only. And the store is called superjuicylife.com. And if you want to buy a ring or this nice watch or this nice dope hat or this sweater or this this hoodie sorry this is a hoodie all of this stuff that i'm wearing basically is from my store okay and you can pick it up right now go to www.superjuicylife.com <laughs> shameless promoter i know but if you want me to make future videos if you want to put food on my table please visit my site right now and insert your credit card <laughs> So that's it for today, and I love you, bug. Mm -hmm.